I'd like to start by congratulating the organizers on a successful event and thanking them for the opportunity to speak. I wish I could be there with you, but instead I'm stuck with minus 20 degree temperatures and crisp snow and will just have to do my best to enjoy the skiing, tobogganing and ice skating. To begin to address the question of large-scale mining and development, much less inclusive, sustainable and resilient development, I think it's critical to put mining in its place. Mining is productive, but it is also destructive of the environment, of communities, and of the health of workers and communities alike. It's called extractive not because it's extracting economic value from rocks, but because it's extracting ore from the earth, and once it's extracted, it cannot be put back. Therefore, mining can only really be considered, in the best case scenario, to be a bridge to sustainability. The activity, products, and revenues generated by mining must be carefully managed in order to not just squeeze out the maximum benefit for the greatest number of people, but to do so in a way that moves away from dependency and builds a diversified and self-sufficient economy. Of course, this includes trying to minimize and mitigate environmental impacts instead of destroying entire drainage basins and aquifers, or not displacing and dispossessing tens of thousands of people at a time, but it goes far beyond that. It means accounting for the true costs of mining development, ensuring that a robust policy, legal, and regulatory framework covers all these aspects. Most importantly, it means overturning the power imbalance between the workers and farmers and the communities affected by mining, on the one hand, and on the other, the transnational mining corporations. It means putting people before profit. It means putting clean water before profit. And it means putting productive land and viable livelihoods before profit. We are already facing a deficit in several dimensions. Most of the richest and easily accessible ores have already been dug and toxic environmental and social legacies of that process are still with us and in many cases getting worse rather than better over time. The mining industry that profited massively from this activity and the governments and agencies that colluded with them domestically and internationally must be held accountable. Most importantly, the damaging practices need to stop. For all the fine language and corporate social responsibility reports or ICMM discussion papers, it would be more meaningful to stop polluting, stop bulldozing people's homes, and stop shooting people. This is a long, but I think necessary, introduction to the topic at hand, the African mining vision and its implementation. Just to be clear, I'm not going to describe the process of development and implementation of the AMV by the African Union and member states. I want to focus on situating the AMV and its implementation in this larger context of inclusive, sustainable and resilient development. As I've often said, the problem with the AMV is not in what it proposes, but in what it omits and how it is used by governments and civil society alike. The AMV doesn't pretend to be a comprehensive development vision, yet unless it is explicitly linked to an agricultural vision and an industrial vision and constrained by them, then governments will inevitably focus on mining as the route to development. No other sector offers the same opportunity for massive foreign investment and export earnings, not to mention personal enrichment with negligible effort on the part of government. Yet it actually requires significant investment in planning, regulation and enforcement and a robust commitment to democratic governance and respect for people's rights, even as it builds powerful political and economic interests that are inimical to such strengthened governance. The AMV provides a thoroughly researched and thoughtful prescription for economic and fiscal policies to ensure that mining really does contribute to development, not just to the wealth of the few. But it does not consider the political constraints, that is to say the power relationships that create, promote, and protect the policies of pillage. It's a simple observation that the contradictions of imposing conditions or demands in the face of industry pressure are too much for many governments, especially when the power of the industry is backed up by the multilateral institutions and development finance agencies. It's telling that the only aspect of the AMV that governments have really picked up on is to increase mineral royalties. The more complex economic measures just require too much work and investment. I don't want to trivialize the importance of actually collecting royalties or of fiscal reform more broadly. 
it is crucially important if the governments and the people, perhaps, of let's say Zambia or Guinea are to benefit meaningfully from existing mining activities and capture some of the value of the minerals they are losing. But it is only one element in the AMV's larger policy panorama, which itself is only one element of a more comprehensive development strategy. And the vociferous resistance from the industry and its allies to even such basic reforms and the difficulty in implementing them is telling. The AMV itself does not address environmental protection, cultural or ecological no-go zones, or the rights of communities or indigenous peoples any more than it addresses the need to protect productive and agricultural land and water supplies. That's not the end of the world, because social pressure and sensitive implementation plans can include these aspects. Rather, the key weakness is the failure of governments and civil society alike to draw a line in the sand and say, enough, no more. I'm not saying that no new mines should be built or that mining should stop today, although I don't think those are inherently ridiculous demands. But allowing mining to continue and new mines to be built without first satisfying the most rigorous conditions or at least developing and committing to a comprehensive and viable transition plan is to perpetuate and facilitate the abusive relationship between mining capital and the rest of us. This is not to say there is no mutual interest, but there is a huge imbalance in who gleans the benefits and who bears the costs. Strong measures are needed to redress that imbalance, and strong legal and public mechanisms to ensure that those measures are not eroded and corrupted. It's here that we find the real contradiction. Technocratic governance, even with transparency, is not the same as democratic governance and self-determination. While it may be possible to design policies and regulatory structures to fundamentally change the relationship between mining investors and host communities, they will not hold up under political and economic pressure unless they are firmly rooted in popular processes. All principles of participatory democracy and development aside, Politicians and civil servants cannot be expected to withstand such pressure on their own. In other respects, the AMV seems perhaps inevitably wedded to state-based politics. The cognitive dissonance is overwhelming in parts of last year's country mining vision. That document was developed under the auspices of the UNECA with the participation of some very good people. But, for example, it uses Morocco's phosphate industry as a case study for successful resource-based development when a significant chunk of Moroccan production actually comes from illegally occupied Western Sahara. Despite the AMV's commitment to making mining serve Africans, not just foreign investors, it's remarkable that it perpetuates the neoliberal commitment to foreign investment and free trade simply by default. Large-scale mining is massively capital intensive, but it doesn't need to be so extreme. And for-profit corporations are not the only way of building and deploying capital. Likewise, the so-called free market, which in reality is subject to massive manipulation by large economic entities, whether countries or corporations, is not the only mechanism for marketing minerals. Yet, the AMV maintains the neoliberal framework that makes states the owners of natural resources only for the purpose of facilitating their extraction, not to participate directly in their extraction, processing, or purchasing. The Freedom Charter calls for the nationalization of mineral wealth. It doesn't say in what form, and there are lots of alternatives to choose from to try to optimize investment, public control, and public benefit. Likewise, if large corporations, cartels, and wealthy countries can stockpile commodities and manipulate their pricing, legally or not, why should it be impossible for poorer countries to do the same? The objectives might be different to maximize and stabilize employment and wages, for example. But that neoliberal orthodoxy cannot be allowed to constrain our policy horizons. Advocacy and activism on mining need to make full use of the AMV, but must keep it situated in the broader context, one where people's needs and the integrity of natural systems set the priorities, not the insatiable greed of transnational capital or self-serving politicians. At the community level, people rarely say, we need a mine. They say they have lots of needs and desires and even dreams. A mine hardly ever figures in them. Yet, 
They're given a mine, even when it will not give them what they need, and even if it will destroy the possibility of ever realizing their own ideals. And sad to say, in many cases, it is our own organizations that do not support them in standing up for their rights, saying instead, the decision is already made elsewhere. All we can do is argue for mitigation and compensation. And yet, the mineral deposits won't go rotten if they're left intact until we can make better decisions about extracting them. That decision might be no, or yes, but it is irreversible. We have to take it seriously. Thank you.